if you really fix the schools, not not the you know, tinkering around the edges type of fixing, but fix the schools so that if you are a poor kid in San Mateo, San Jose, Washington, D.C., Oakland, that you have the same opportunity to to read on grade level, go to college, graduate from college as anybody else. If you really fix the school system, then your homeless rate, your jobless rates, your mental health, everything, crime drops dramatically. I'm Joe Lonsdale. Welcome to the American Optimist. Adrian, you've been a a, I think an awesome mayor, a very successful investor, and a, and a good friend. It's great to have you here today. Thanks for joining. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. You were one of the first people that I met when I moved to Silicon Valley um, nine years ago. So uh, I'm you're you're my first podcast ever. Um, except I did one when I was at Andreessen Horowitz on our uh, on our internal podcast with Mayor Bowser. We kind of did a old mayor and new mayor podcast for them. Awesome. Well, so this, so, so I guess this, I guess this past spring you announced the formation of Mac Venture Capital, and uh, it's it's a it's a hundred ten million dollar inaugural fund. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. What inspired you to become an investor, and what do you, what are you focused on there? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so I've kind of been working on this um, for for nine nine years or so. So, um, after leaving the public sector, I uh, I started helping some some startups on the East Coast, and then started making trips to California. And then, like I just mentioned, I, I was lucky enough to get an advisor role at Andreessen Horowitz in September 2012 and ended up staying with those guys uh, almost four and a half years. And I just loved it so much. And we can talk at, at any at about any part of, of that. I just loved working there and on Sand Hill Road and with, with tech entrepreneurs and, uh, and the team there that I wanted to do it on my own. I wanted to have my own fun. And so I did two um, small proof of concept funds. Uh, one was like $10 million, one was like $15 million. And then this fund, Mac Venture Capital, which we launched in 2019 and closed this year, uh, we, we were only trying to raise $100 million. We were oversubscribed and we our legal close was 110 And uh, we've been investing in some great companies, uh, one or two with uh, with you guys over at HBC, which, which makes us W3. Tell me about some of your portfolio companies that are trying to solve problems that matter to you, or right? anything like that, where you're investing in something that's working on a really cool problem, or like, like what, what are you inspired by lately? Oh yeah, um, there was a really good uh, article in Fast Company in the past two weeks about our our company called Spora Health. This is a deal we co-led with M13 and, and Refractor. It's uh, it's telemedicine and telehealth for for the enterprise, for really big organizations that, uh, that have, you know, big insurance plans and, 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 and have, um, a lot of employees, it's geared towards their African-American employees. And what is geared towards is helping doctors really understand some of the root causes of health disparities for, for African-Americans who work in these, in these, um, fortune 500 companies. Uh, and uh, the the CEO Dan Miller is just a really thoughtful, great entrepreneur. It's you know he's already they, the the company's already kind of oversubscribed, and we think it's going to be a, a tremendous business success. He's got a, a great contract with United. What, what just, are uh, I'm I'm, cur- I'm curious to understand that better, Adrian. Actually, so what are sure, what sure. are some of the causes of uh, of health inequities within these Fortune 500 companies? What's what's going on there? Well, okay, so it's, again, th- his company is specifically targeted to, to the African American employees in these companies, and it, yeah. it helps doctors understand some health disparities. So, one could be nutrition, for example, and this is this is highlighted in the Fast Company article. If you if you are in the African American community, you are more likely to have a certain diet, and that certain diet may lead you to have certain health outcomes that are different than another population. And so, what Spora does with software is train doctors. To understand those root causes to better care for the patient. That's fascinating. So there's actually just different averages of what people do based on their different backgrounds. And then you can kind of address how those cultural differences need to be addressed. That's interesting. Yeah, if you were talking to a doctor, and I know this from working in public health as mayor and city council member, they would talk about diabetes. They would talk about hypertension. There's a lot of actual uh, issues that affect the African American community. Um, I'm not an expert, but but these things are almost fact at this point. 
Yeah, no, no, that's that's fascinating. And, and and I know I know bringing diversity to private equity is one of your real driving missions. You talk about and how are you thinking of how are you thinking about affecting change in that regard? What what are you doing on that front? It kind of relates to this. Yeah. So I mean, so first of all, you know, we're we're trying to build you know a very successful fund. You know that that returns money for its investors and has a great reputation with our entrepreneurs. Those are two of our top priorities. We are a majority African American fund. So there's there's four GPs, three are African American. Um, and so what, what we're trying to do first and foremost is to, to show that the venture capital is a place for everybody, for, for women, for Latinos, for African-Americans, for people, for immigrants. Uh, and so we're doing, and so our fund was actually the biggest first time fund for a majority African-American, uh, group. And, uh, and we've got some great investors, uh, so many of whom, you know, so, so thank you. And, and, and some of them. And so what we do is we just want to have a really broad funnel. And so at the top, so mm -hmm. at the top, you should, we should have women uh, entrepreneurs, we should have, you know, minority entrepreneurs, immigrant entrepreneurs. And by broadening the top of the funnel, we're going to do two things. We're going to have the most amazing companies to invest in, and we're going to have really diverse led companies. And, and we've been successful at that so far. That's awesome. No, that's, that's, that's really healthy for the industry. What I want to also ask you about your investing. You've been posting a lot on Twitter about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, and it sounds like you're pretty into decentralized finance right now. What do you, what do you, what do you think about, about the cryptocurrency world and DeFi? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on it for sure. Um, and a lot of that stems from the fact that, you know, I was, I was at Idris and Horowitz when, you know, we, we, when we invested in Coinbase, or when mm -hmm. when Mark and Chris were, were were just talking about Bitcoin, when no one else was talking about, it. I for me it makes perfect sense, right? I mean everything like everything else is is going uh, to technological innovation. Why why wouldn't money? It, it, I already use my watch, my Apple Pay all the time. It makes more sense that it's my money and I don't have to go to a bank to use oh, it. I love it. It's pretty unusual for somebody who is a mayor to, to think like that because this is kind of like decentralizing some of the government's role a little bit. I love it. You're kind of on, on the on the, on the the edge of what's normal there. I'll ask you a little bit about yeah, I, being a mayor, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I think if you told people that I was an unusual mayor, they would say, yep, that's him. Um, <laughs> well, you're unusual so, in a good way. There's been some pretty bad DC mayors too in the last few decades. I think you, I think you, I think you were, you know, you, you did a lot of bold things. I appreciate it. Um, so, so we, I mean, even before I worked in the private sector, we took a real private sector approach to running the government, which to me meant you hire the best people that, that you move really fast, that, you know, you, that you have metrics for things, you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 you and I think a lot very similarly about government, right? So we would have these hearings in the government, right? And, and the so-called advocates would come to testify. And at the end of their testimony, their number one demand was that we would increase the budget for whatever they were testifying about, uh -huh. right? And that was it. They didn't like they, they didn't care about how what our performance was or whether we had met. They, they, didn't, know, show, they didn't show the metrics. Like one of the metrics you hit is you reduced violent crime dramatically from 2007 to 2011. That's it's very impressive, yeah. right? You, you you guys crushed it. So 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 you were watch you were watching all the metrics basically is what you're saying. Other people weren't. Our police chief, you know, her, she had unsolved cases by her detectives. Every year they had to reduce those unsolved cases. If there was it. if there was violent crime, homicides, those things had to go down or else there had to be an answer for why they wouldn't. You couldn't just say we need more money to solve the problem. And, and that's what we find missing from government too much is real hardcore performance metrics that are actually met by the politicians. I, I love it. And I think one of the reasons people got pretty angry at you on the union side is you appointed Michelle Rhee as chancellor of DC public schools, really shocked a lot of people. She's someone who obviously was focused on these metrics in a way that was out of the control of the usual special interest. Uh, you know, you guys worked together to support charters in DC, you closed down feeling schools. Like where, where did that push come from? It, it really, I think it surprised a lot of people. And I, you know, I, I for one was just really amazed by what you were doing there. It took a lot of courage and it made a lot of people angry at you. No, I really appreciate that, Joe. And, and you, you say that to, to so many people when we're in, in private groups also. So to me, like when I was hired as mayor, like I was the CEO of the city. And, and as a CEO, your job is to take on the toughest problem. And I thought from day one that if we didn't tackle education, that our city would never maximize its potential. Um, so, so we went right out of the gate to, to take over the school system, to actually have the mayor in control the way Richard Daly and New York, I mean, in Chicago and Mayor Bloomberg in New York had done. 
And so once I got control of the system, I wanted to find the best, most talented, hard charging and visionary uh, CEO I could find. And that, that was Michelle. I love it. You she were was, already an angel investor even back then when you were mayor, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had a very disruptive mindset, uh, let's just say. But Michelle, di- Michelle, what she did—the funniest thing, Joe. Here's the funniest thing: is there was I took this to the to, to testimony of the city council. We had I had five reports that had been done over the last 15 years, which mapped out everything that needed to be done to change our school system for the kids who were in it. And the problem wasn't that what that people didn't know what to be done is that no one had ever done what was in these reports. So wow. all we did for the four years I was in office and Michelle was the chancellor was implement these things. Now, they were very controversial and, and tough, tough decisions, but people already knew what needed to be done. Wow. You just actually asked someone to do it. How do, how do we apply, Adrian, how do we apply that education reform mindset to other areas across government, like criminal justice reform, to hold failing institutions accountable? Like what else? Are there more things we could be doing there in, in, in government to take what works in these one area and put in others as well? Yeah, a couple of things. So one... If you if you really fix the schools, not not the you know, tinkering around the edges type of fixing, but fix the schools so that if you are a poor kid in San Mateo, San Jose, Washington D.C., Oakland, that you have the same opportunity to to read on grade level, go to college, graduate from college as anybody else. If you really fix the school system, then your homeless rate, your jobless rates, your mental health. Everything crime drops dramatically. That's a great point. So education is kind of the core of a lot of these problems. So these these kids aren't getting the right opportunities. That makes e- sense. Education is really the only real uh, way to interrupt the cycle of poverty in this country. But so the, so to answer your question in in full, what we told our cabinet, I had forty cabinet members when I was mayor, was that the the only way that that they that they were not allowed to say no to this to to the chancellor of the school system, whatever the chancellor needed to get her job done, which was basically to educate, you know, the kids in our system, they had to, they had to, uh, they had to do. So if it was the police department, if we needed better safety in the school, the police department had to respond to school. If it was mental health, if the kids in the school system needed more mental health services, they had to get that to the, if it was technology, if our chief technology officer, you know, if, if she needed better computers or whatever, if mm-hmm. we need a partnership with Google or, or, or Yahoo at the time, he, he had to do that. And that's how we kind of approached it comprehensively. That's awesome. That's awesome. But but the education is really at the core. I you know I I guess I, I if I'd love to get your opinion on what's going on with like the core values we're teaching our kids right now. There's a lot of people who believe there's things that you know our leaders are supposed to have courage, which you've obviously shown. You know charity, prudence, you know restraint, all all these types of values. And there's a lot of a lot of families in America don't seem to be giving their kids these values as much as they did in the past a lot. I, I guess you, you, you know the numbers better than me where over the last 60 years, right, it's, it's gone from it's gone from 5% and 30% for, for 5% and 25% for white and black families to, to I think it's now over 70% for black families that don't have, you know, don't have to, you know, a father who's there in their lives and over 30%, for, you know, for, for white kids. And it seems like that's part of the problem too, tied to education or how, how do you think about those and how can we be confronting that? Well, the one thing that we really tried to approach was like um, making sure that so we you know, we supported all, all kinds of education. In D.C., it was basically whatever education would provide a great – whatever type of education would provide a great curriculum to the kids, we, su- we supported it. So we were very open on choice and alternative, like you said, charter schools. But even in our traditional public school system, we wanted ingenuity and innovation. So that would absolutely um, – that would absolutely include lots of different uh, ways to teach values or to teach um, things that, that a teacher or principal thought uh, were important. So, but what Michelle and I were, were big on, we weren't going to prescribe those things from the top. It's, it's much the same way that we as venture capitalists support, support entrepreneurs. You know, you look for an amazing entrepreneur who has a great vision for the future. That's the same thing we look for in teachers and principals. I love it. If they have yeah. a great vision, if they know how to teach kids, you let them run with it. You know, let them actually create a whole new school way of doing a school. That's how America works best is bottom up with innovation. And then if it works, you could take it and you scale it, I guess, huh? Absolutely. We didn't want to have one cookie cutter way for every school. Someone said to me once when I was running for mayor, don't, don't try to have an excellent school system, have a system of excellent schools. And that's kind of how we approached it. And 
and uh, again, it's it, it's what we do every day in, in venture capital. I've, I've got 37 portfolio companies. Each and every one of them looks completely different. Their 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 CEOs are completely different. Their teams, but they're all you know really great about shaping the future. I love it. I, I love it. I think that's what I, I, we always say at Cicero Institute, my policy group. The great leaders focus on the system and focus on making the system better. I, lo- I love how you thought about that for education. If you if you have an answer in discussion, if you don't mind, what 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 do we do about you know, I guess a lot of these kids that are born to these single mothers, it's that, you know, the, the data says that's a huge problem in terms of their outcomes. Is there something that we can be doing there? A lot of people believe that the incentives we've given on Medicaid and welfare have shifted that a bad way. Is that something you think about at all? Yeah. So, so like the more complicated the problem, the more I, I try and over, I try and simplify it, sometimes oversimplify it. So here's something that Rahm Emanuel tried to do when he was the mayor of Chicago. So, so you've got you got three three girls. I've I've got I've got three kids also, right? So when when your kids come home from school, I know they're young. When they come, you're gonna make sure that you at least figure out like what homework they have, how they get it done, yep. and and they turn it in, all that type of stuff. And so it's not just the six hours of school. It's you're gonna you and your wife are gonna do it for two or three more hours after school at a minimum. Yep. But what happens in a lot of communities? There's not that support when, when after school. And so what Ron was trying to do when he was mayor of Chicago, he said we're gonna extend the school day. Because we know that in some poor communities, it would be better for them to just stay longer, do the homework there, have tutoring. And he got such pushback from this. He got pushback from his own union, from other <laughs> special interest groups, you know, people who literally did not want to extend the school day for poor kids who needed more of an As education. a 10-year-old, I would have been kind of bummed, too, if you extended my school day. I mean, I see where he's coming from. But <laughs> <laughs> That's why you don't let 10-year-olds run the system. I mean, it's tough love. Yeah. Uh, but in, in all seriousness, you know, I mean, Chicago has a deep, serious crime issue. One of my really I, good friends, Matt Mickelson's son, he's uh, his his good friend just got shot and killed three days ago under a stray bullet there in Chicago. So there's definitely a problem they gotta they gotta address. They've got to fix their school system. All those kids coming through have to have better educational opportunities so they can be a great part of the workforce and aren't out shooting each other. Yeah. Well, there's, well, there, I, I think some of what you were doing showing off as a leader is, is definitely leading the way. So I hope we can embrace embrace more of that, Adrian. I, I, I want to ask you a little more about America as a whole. We started the American Optimist because we're concerned there's a lot of fear and division in our society and a lot of people who you know really don't believe in America, who think America is a bad place now, who are, who are pretty negative on it. And I, I'm, cur- I'm curious, to get, you've gone through a lot of things where you've done amazing work. You've had a lot of people be pretty nasty to you. What, what, what are your thoughts on America? No, I, 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 that's why I love what you're doing. I'm super optimistic, and and for and for so many reasons, things are not perfect. I, I, I question some things that individuals are doing all the time, but but the country, I, I think, has the exact right formula to help everyone. And and now we just have to work a little bit harder, be a little bit tougher, smarter in making that system work. It, it, it's interesting. I know you usually ask people about like books. That people read. I, I listened to a lot more books during the pandemic, and if you listen to like you know, I listened to like the uh, the life and, and times of Frederick Douglass, amazing mm-hmm. book. Now I'm listening to you know Alexander Hamilton. It's I mean, I mean what these guys were doing, you know, three, two, three, four hundred years ago with you know so much less resources, and we have all these resources available to us, and we're doing some amazing things, but we really have nothing to complain about. We have all the resources to to solve homelessness or to educate kids or to you know, send people to, to Mars, build electric I cars. totally agree. If you look at the life of Frederick Douglass and what, you know, starting off treated so badly as a slave and uneducated and then figuring out how to educate himself. And that, that guy, that guy didn't, didn't, didn't know. Like if you, if you looked at him from the outside, you would have said it was totally impossible. He just like, he, you know, he was extraordinary American. He just went all the way there. It is, I get a little frustrated about, some of these mindsets, because I, I agree there's been a lot of negative things that have happened, even even like more recently, like redlining and stuff, right, where the house people are, you know, people were treated really badly based on their race, even 50, 60 years ago. But then I also think like, gosh, you know, it's it must be possible after two generations if you want to, 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 to figure it out. I, I, I don't know. I don't I, I This victim mentality stuff bothers me a lot. How do, how do you how do you how do you think about that? Frederick Douglass, as a like, was a slave for the first eighteen years of his life. He started a newspaper. Like I can't. Mm-hmm. Even, like, I I don't know if I could start a newspaper <laughs> today. He started a yeah. newspaper. No, I know. You know, in the eighteen hundreds. You know what he did with the first quarter that that he earned? He went and paid 
to, to register to vote. That's the very first thing he did with the first quarter he made. I love you it. You know what I mean? And we still have people who aren't even registered to vote. You know, he actually it was illegal for him to be registered to vote, but he did it anyway because he just he wanted to participate in 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 the democracy of his country so much. So we have people who aren't registered to vote. You know, people who don't, you know, who aren't paying attention to, to, to voting. And, and you know, 200 years ago, Frederick Douglass and his contemporaries were, you know, using their first quarter to, to figure out how to do so illegally. I love Frederick Douglass' July 4th speech. I think it was in 1852 or three, where he was very well spoken. He talked about the amazing values of this country, but then said, you know, you guys should be ashamed because these values are obviously being betrayed by the fact that we still have slavery. And I thought that was a very good perspective, obviously. And he, and he fought and he, and he ended that. It's, it, what's interesting today is this: the people who are fighting uh, on the more progressive side, it's they don't they don't start by acknowledging the greatness of the values and saying we could be better. A lot of them just start by saying how horrible things are. Is that wh- wh- where's that coming from? And, and and you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, you, and you know what's great? I mean, Frederick Douglass, he was trying to fix it from the inside. He wasn't yeah. being meek, but he was trying to fix the problem from the inside. If, he, if he's going to make himself a voter, he went to Abraham Lincoln's White House. And I think these days people are trying to fix it too much from the from the outside. They're just, as you say, they're either complaining or they're 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 criticizing someone who's actually the, you know in the arena trying to fix it. Yep. You know, I give you a lot of credit. I've gone to a lot of your events. You have politicians come to your events sometimes. You are actively engaged with them. It, to me, you know, if you're going to complain about you know the you know what's going on in San Francisco or California then you should also be trying to do something about it in any way you can. But don't just complain that San Francisco has too much homelessness or California has too much taxes. You know, yeah. use your influence to talk to people to try to fix things. And that's that's what that's how I think you fix things from the inside. That's the great part about our country, but you got to get involved. That's and, that, and, that, and that's what you did too. I want, I want to ask back to the entrepreneurs before we finish here. You spent a lot of time, Adrian, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs. What inspires you most about the future of our country and, and what innovation is going to transform our country the most over the coming decade? Yeah, the thing I love about entrepreneurs is that they are idealistic, uh, that they want to change the world, and that they are not afraid to take chances and, and be disruptive. Um, you know, you know, we, we've, we've invested in companies that are addressing healthcare, fintech. We've actually got a couple investments now of, of companies that are disrupting space. Um, you know, really, we've got a company called Stoke, which is actually building reusable rockets that you will be able to use almost every day, just like you use airplanes. So there's so many different things that we're excited about. And we're going to be open to entrepreneurs who have really big ideas that that, that are important and, and can be successful and, and that will, it will help shape the future. And, 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 if you're, and, and if we're successful, if these entrepreneurs are doing a great job. You know, what's the world look like by 2050? How's it, how's America changed? Well, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, I think it depends on where you are, say, you know, where we are, I hope the cities are cleaner and safer. You know what I mean? I, I, I won't be able to answer that question without saying, you know, I hope that we'll, we've done a better job at, you know, at, at educating, you know, people who are, are poor and who are coming from more disadvantaged communities. And, uh, and look, I'll finish on, on a highlight. Like, you know, when I, Silicon Valley has a long way to go, right? We've, we've got a long way to go in making sure women and minorities and other people have access. But I've seen change since I moved there. You know what I mean? I, again, you know, I've seen you know, really great things happen in hiring and investing. And so the, the, the approach I think that you're taking with this podcast is not to say, that there that there isn't any need for change. It's the, to take the progress that we've made and to just accelerate it even more. And uh, I think Silicon Valley is a big part of it. I, I see it as the biggest renaissance for business, maybe in the history of the world. And that and that should and and will include everybody. Awesome. Well, Adrian, you're a great leader and investor and visionary, and I hope to go on a run again soon. It's good to talk to you. Nah, thanks, Joe. Don't outsprint me at the end this time. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.